Hi, everybody, uh, and uh, welcome to uh, Power Foundation's webinar series. Uh, I want to kick off this starting to say that we are recording the session. Uh, it's going to be available on demand afterwards, but I'll jump straight into uh, today's agenda. Uh, my name is Cecilia Dahlström. Uh, I'm the Secretary General at Par Foundation. And with me today, I have Gabriel. Okay. Gabriel is our communication manager and uh, he is uh, running the webinar series. So he will be taking care of questions. He will be the one to reach out to if you want uh, a recording afterwards and he can guide you where to find it. Today we have two speakers with us. Uh, we have uh, Srujana, I uh, hope I say that correctly, and Emmanuel. Um, and before we go into uh, today's topics, I just want to give you a brief intro to PAR and the work that we do. Uh, PAR Foundation uh, stands for the Foundation to Prevent Antibiotic Resistance. And uh, we aim to be part of a movement that helps eradicate the spread of antibiotic resistance. The way we want to do that is by supporting research and uh, educative initiatives uh, that work in the area of prevention. And we've done that since uh, 2017. Since the start, uh, we've uh, worked and, and supported 25 projects uh, across uh, the globe, actually, we've uh, had uh, projects run in Europe, Africa, Asia. And this year we have our first uh, project uh, in Latin America as well. So that's very exciting. Since the start, uh, we have um, uh, funded about 16 million Swedish crowns into these research and educative projects. And over the years, we've built up a community of uh, 1,000 plus members that are engaged and work together with us to, to make this happen. Uh, we believe that uh, the work that we do together with our grantees is really important. We've zoomed in on awareness and being able to educate uh, the general public, but also um, health workers in the fact that uh, preventive actions can make a difference. This year, uh, we're uh, moving into uh, the actual uh, making it happen phase. So at the moment, we have eight active programs running and um, eight new projects that are just about to launch. Uh, we've had over 10,000 people being educated last year, and uh, we hope to double and triple that number during 2023. Uh, and as I said, this community of um, healthcare workers and uh, ambassadors are helping to spread the word and helping to, to make a difference. And that's why we're so happy to work and uh, engage with all of you. That's very brief about PAR Foundation. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker today, uh, Srijana. Uh, and I'm actually going to hand over to you to tell a little bit about yourself. Uh, you're in the US, it's early morning for you today. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, I really want to thank uh, the Par Foundation and uh, especially uh, Cecilia and Gabriel for organizing this and inviting me to speak here. Um, so I work at um, Rutgers University in New Jersey. I'm an assistant professor um, in the genetics department and at the Maxon Institute of Microbiology, which is one of the um, uh, first microbiology institutes here. Um, and yeah, we're really um, excited to uh, study uh, fundamental uh, mechanisms and bacterial stress response, um, which will um, help actually um, 
study uh, how antimicrobial resistance or uh, antimicrobial mechanisms evolve in bacteria. Thank you. Uh, would you like I me to... I will stop sharing and uh, let mm -hmm. you take over the screen. Yeah. And um, while uh, doing so, um, for those of you participating, if you have questions uh, during the speech, then type them in a Q&A and, and Graybeard will um, assist in getting the questions to through Jana. But uh, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, so yes, the title of my talk today would be Small Proteins and Their Roles in Bacterial Stress Response. Uh, so before I jump into that, I just want to briefly mention that uh, we are really interested in understanding regulatory pathways that underlie stress response. And we're focused on understanding the roles of two uh, kinds of players. One is the epitranscriptomic factors that are involved in uh, RNA modification pathways. And the second, which will be the focus of today's talk, are small proteins that are less than 50 amino acids long in uh, prokaryotes. And I'll, I'll um, focus on small proteins going forward. Um, as uh, uh, you know, this audience is not alien to this. Um, we know all of us understand how important uh, this problem of antibiotic resistance is. And what we want to contribute in uh, from our end is to understand the basic mechanisms that can then help clinical scientists to identify and design better um, drugs and also um, identify better drug targets. So you're all probably very familiar with regulatory mechanisms such as transcription factors, uh, regulatory RNAs involving ribose switches and small RNAs. These are mechanisms that are very well studied right now. And, um, and of course, there are more that have become textbook examples. Something that people are less familiar with and that has been um, coming up over the past um, decade or more um, is this idea of small proteins as regulators of stress response and gene expression. So here I'm talking about proteins that are encoded as less than 50 amino acids long. And we find that most of these proteins, um, they seem to be condition specific. Not all of them are expressed all the time and they are uh, likely niche and organism specific as well. So we are really interested as a, as, a, as a lab that wants to understand stress response pathways, we are really interested in understanding small proteins and their contribution to these stress responses. So um, just as an introduction, I want to say that in E. coli alone, which is a well-studied prokaryotic model organism, we find there is at least 150 documented small proteins. And these were missed in the past because when genomes were annotated, small open reading frames were not considered as genes. And anything longer than 150 base pairs in prokaryotes or anything longer than 300 base pairs in eukaryotes was considered a gene. And then um, when we started studying uh, different systems, uh, people have come across anecdotally smaller proteins that are less than that cutoff that play very important roles in gene expression regulation. And so now this has sort of opened up a more systematic investigation of all of these small open reading frames and what they encode, and then characterization of their functions. So we know from the handful of examples that have been well studied, we know that these small proteins can affect transport, cell division, signal transduction, et cetera. And about a third of them, a minimum 30% of them are predicted to be membrane pro proteins. So that uh, affect um, other larger membrane uh, proteins. So the mode of action for most of these small proteins is less well understood. But as you can imagine, we think of these small proteins as this layer of regulation at the protein level, where once you've made the protein, the cell has invested all its resources in making these larger proteins. If the conditions are suddenly not good for that larger protein to be active, you have this small protein inhibitor goes and modulates its activity. That's just one example. So we think of small proteins as regulators of these larger protein functions when um, they are needed or they're not needed in some, some cases. So why do we call them small proteins? 
So at least in the prokaryotic field here in the U.S., um, we are trying to term these uh, proteins as small proteins and not peptides or mini peptides or mini proteins or other names that are in the literature. Um, we just want to uh, clarify that small proteins are made from their own genes. They're not proteolytically cleaved off of larger proteins. They're not peptides that are artificially made or processed in any form. They are encoded as their own protein from their own genes. So that's basically how we're defining uh, small proteins. And they're present in all organisms. Again, genome annotation uh, missed these in the previous years. So they are present everywhere. But what is very interesting, I think, for us from therapeutic potential is to understand that many of these small proteins are niche or organism specific and even condition specific. So what we can design then are very specific um, targets that are affecting a subset of the bacteria or organism, not everything as a whole. So that's something to keep in mind. I want to just um, emphasize that from those small uh, number of small proteins that have been studied, we know of all these examples that I sort of alluded to in the earlier slide that affect transport um, of um, different um, macromolecules and um, metals. And you also have proteins, small proteins that affect larger complexes that control drug efflux, et cetera. So these examples are uh, discussed in detail in our recent review that I will refer you to because I won't have time to go into those details. Uh, but we know that definitely these small proteins are modulating very important larger proteins and um, regulating their functions um, as part of stress response. So we, uh, in my lab, one of the projects that was spearheaded by a graduate student was to understand and characterize condition-specific small proteins. And we picked a low magnesium stress as one of our uh, study conditions. Uh, magnesium, as you all are familiar, is really important divalent cation that's uh, necessary for maintaining protein and RNA structure and function. Um, so that is something that uh, we really um, thought it's a very important stress condition. So we know that a handful of these proteins that I showed you MGTS right here, which both um, regulates MGTA magnesium transporter and PIT-A uh, phosphate transporter, and this MGRB, which is um, a regulator of a sensor kinase called 4Q, and another small protein called PMRR uh, talks to um, this protein called LXPT, uh, sorry, LPXT, which is involved in outer membrane modifications. So these are the three proteins, small proteins, we know are induced under magnesium starvation and are doing uh, important uh, functions. So we wondered what other small proteins are expressed under this condition? Are these the only three? And how can we identify them and characterize them? But small proteins are really hard to study. So as a basic research lab, we are really also interested in developing tools that are catered to looking at smaller proteins as opposed to the normal standard size proteins that everyone is used to. So even as an example, I want to say, um, if you're running a protein gel, you it's so easy to miss a small protein that's running at a few kilodaltons length. So every biochemical assay that you can think of is generally catered towards a larger protein. So we are also developing methods in parallel to study smaller proteins. So the small protein characterization has been really lagging behind because of this, these difficulties. So that's where our focus is. And so here we're really interested in understanding which small proteins are expressed under magnesium starvation and what are the characteristics of these small proteins that we know nothing about. So we used um, an adapted uh, or modified method based on ribosome profiling. For those who may be familiar with ribosome profiling, this is the method that involves, um, uh, for those who are not familiar with this method, this is the method that involves ribosome mapping ribosome footprints along the mRNA um, in, a, in a given cell under a given condition. So when we uh, do these experiments, 
Uh, oftentimes, larger mRNAs have more footprints because they can carry more ribosomes. So we've modified this method uh, or we've, we've adapted, uh, we're using a method that was developed um, in 2019 and adapted this to study um, small protein encoding mRNAs. So here we can actually identify which genes are being um, expressed under a given stress condition. So using this, we're able to compare uh, small proteins that are um, expressed under no stress condition and under magnesium starvation condition, and then uh, further um, uh, study these in detail. So here I'm showing you a plot that is um, um, showing our hits from our ribosome profiling assay, where we can identify these small uh, red dots represent the small proteins. Uh, I'm just marking the two small proteins we already know are expressed under this condition. And here we see that several small proteins are accumulated at higher levels under stress condition, and these are all novel to us. And so we have about a have uh, 70 list of 17 and many of these uh, you don't have to really focus on the details here but uh, what you can sort of notice i believe is that most of these are of unknown function and they are yet to be characterized and this is the first time we have identified them in the context of magnesium starvation so here we are really going to um, look at transcriptional regulation of all each of these candidates how they are regulated at the transcriptional level and where they are localized, can we uh, look into where they're localized? And that can tell us a little bit about where the targets could be. And overexpression and deletion phenotypes to understand how important these proteins are for cell physiology. So we've used RNA-seq and promoter reporter assays to characterize these. And we find that a majority of our candidates, uh, the small proteins are regulated, in fact, at the transcriptional level. Um, and I want to say that some of the assays we have now are also looking at which regions are responsible for regulating them and which transcription factors are responsible for regulating them. So these are details that um, I won't really go into, but I, I just want to show one example where um, we are able to show uh, very uh, nicely the induction of expression transcription activation under these low magnesium conditions relative to no stress in a transcription factor dependent manner. Um, and we find that several of these uh, small proteins are part of operons as well. So, and we also characterize the localization um, using bioinformatic prediction as well as epitope tagging. And we find that roughly half our candidates are localized to the membrane, which means they might be regulating um, very important candidates within the membrane, including drug reflux pumps. They could be regulating transport proteins, ion channels, or even a sensor kinases or signal transduction proteins. Um, so then uh, we are also interested in looking at their overexpression and deletion phenotypes. Um, we have found very interesting phenotypes associated with each of these small proteins. As an example, I want to cherry pick um, one of them uh, and talk about its effect on growth and cell morphology. So here I'm showing you that increased expression of one of our hits, PMRR, leads to a very severe growth defect. Um, so especially it has a very, very long lag phase and also the exponential phase is, uh, you can see the growth rate is uh, much, much lower compared to the um, cells that are not expressing this protein. Uh, so we also find that it is specific to this small protein. So when working with these smaller proteins, one of the challenge is that we want to show the phenotypes are really associated with the small protein. So we have controls in place to make sure when we mutate the start codon of this small protein, we are a, we lose that growth defect and it goes back looking like the wild type strain. So um, there are several controls we carry out similar to this to show that our effects are indeed specific to the small protein. So we've also noticed um, morphology differences. So when we uh, express this small protein, the cells are growing as much, much smaller in cell size. So we were able to quantify that as well. And uh, we see that expression of some of these small proteins is tightly regulated because the cell doesn't want too much or too little of it. So I'm not showing you here the phenotype for a deletion of PMRR 
And uh, we see that there is a growth defect when you delete PMRR as well, um, as opposed to, uh, similar to overexpressing it. So you do not want to have too much of it or too little of it. And so again, that's something that goes into uh, how these small proteins are playing regulatory roles and their levels are important for cell physiology. So right now, the ongoing work and future work uh, is uh, focused on understanding how small proteins differ between commensals and pathogenic bacteria. So we are really interested in uh, the composition of the same small proteins expressed between commensals and pathogens and how their expression varies um, in different stress conditions. And we're also interested really in characterizing their um, targets. Uh, in the uh, in the cells, so we really want to understand what they're targeting and how they're modulating the larger protein functions. So, as part of this, we're developing a method uh, that's based on uh, in vivo crosslinking. So, just to give you a brief overview, uh, what we are doing is we have libraries of oligonucleotides where we have modifications at every single codon or each amino acid position that will allow us to make variants of a small protein where every single position is modified within a natural amino acid that can cross-link in vivo to its target. So then we are able to isolate cross-link complexes of small proteins with the large proteins and identify them uh, by doing mass spec analysis. So this is something that's work in progress. And I just want to leave you with this idea here that small proteins can really have therapeutic potential and some of them could um, directly act as antibiotic uh, targets or antibacterial targets. And some may act as alternative drug targets for the development of new antimicrobials. So um, there are examples actually in development in the uh, small protein field for both these cases. Uh, so we are really excited to contribute to that uh, with our study. Uh, and um, I would like to really highlight and thank the people that are involved in the work. So in bold um, are the people that are associated with these, with the project over the past uh, three to four years um, and uh, from my own lab as well as our collaborators. So I uh, thank you all for your attention and welcome any questions. Thank you so much. I think this is very exciting to see the, the progress in the work that you've done. Gabriel, I thought there was one question, right? You have to unmute, Gabriel. Yes, yeah, so, so we have two questions uh, for... Uh, Go ahead. So uh, the first question, are these small proteins regulated by two component systems? That's the first mm -hmm. question. And mm -hmm. then the second question for you is, do you think these small protein, proteins are similar to toxin and toxin systems? Great question. So uh, for, I'll tackle the first one uh, first. So I gave you three examples of uh, small proteins that are induced under low magnesium stress. And here I'm showing this MGRB. I would like to focus your attention there. Um, so... 4Q4P2 component system is in fact regulating the gene expression of MGRB. So definitely there are examples of small proteins that are directly under the regulation of two component systems. But in this case, interestingly, MGRB itself binds to the one of the components of the two component system and inhibits it. So it's a negative feedback loop. And there's a very interesting example. There are also examples of small proteins that are connecting. So here EVGS, A2 component system regulates the expression of another smallish protein called SAFE that directly targets and activates 4Q in E. coli. So uh, we definitely have examples of several small proteins that are regulated directly by the two component systems um, and, uh, or, and or, or target other two component systems. But there are several others that are not regulated by two component systems as well. Yeah. And sorry, uh, what was the second question again? <laughs> so I pasted them in the chat. So the second question, do you think these small proteins are similar to toxin and to toxin systems? Oh, uh, yeah, great question. So actually, there are examples of uh, small proteins that are part of toxin antitoxin systems. Uh, yes, definitely. So we see that um, the small proteins, just like any large proteins, have very different functionalities. And we have examples of small proteins that are regulating 
all these other different kinds of membrane proteins, but there are also toxin antitoxin systems. Um, there are examples from both E. coli salmonella published work. Um, I would refer to um, this Zoro system that has been talked about. Zoro is a small protein as well. That's part of uh, toxin antitoxin system. Um, and there are several others actually potentially uh, toxic. So there are a lot of small proteins that are um, toxic and whether they're part of TA systems is yet to be determined. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very exciting. I'm very glad that you could join us today and share about the work that you do. Uh, so thank you again. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. The second uh, speaker we have today is uh, actually one of our grantees, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, you started to work uh, a good year ago with uh, a study in Ghana uh, in elderly care. But could you please uh, first just briefly introduce yourself? Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, Par Foundation, thank you, Gabriel and then Cecilia. A nice presentation is through Jana. My name is Emmanuel Ama knew that uh, um, I work with Biomedical and Public Health Research Units and at the Water Research Institute CSIR Ghana. Um, I am I am a research assistant or principal technologist, and then I carry out antimicrobial resistance um, as my niche of research. So um, I do a lot of surveillance of antimicrobial resistance. Currently, I'm working in the human, specifically the elderly group uh, who are resident in nursing homes, looking at the resistance that are going on within such settings. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I will stop sharing and give you um, um, the opportunity to give us a presentation on the work that you've done so far. Okay, so I don't know whether my screen is visible, is yeah, it? Perfect, it's perfect. Thank okay, you. so thank you very much once again. And then let me say welcome to all of you who have joined us. So I mentioned my name already, Emmanuel Ahmad. So this is what I'm coming to talk briefly about. Antimicrobial resistance malice, the case of Ghanaian nursing homes. Um, so the talk will take from introduction to methodology, research uh, results, sorry, then the conclusion and then the acknowledgement. Okay, so as I said earlier on, I, I'm working around antimicrobial resistance. That is when pathogens become resistant to um, the drugs that they use to kill them. So with exposure of drugs to pathogens, for a number of times, you realize that the pathogens get uh, resistance within them. They have all enzymes that fight these drugs. So with time, they become resistant to these drugs. So that is a brief uh, description of what antimicrobial resistance is. Uh, now, I mentioned earlier on that I'm focusing on the elderly. Elderly have uh, vulnerability because of their age, uh, mainly because when they grow old, the immune system becomes more susceptible to infections. And so we most of the time treat the elderly and give them more antibiotics in terms of treatment compared to the younger generation. So gen uh, resistance that set in becomes serious among the elderly compared to the younger generation. So that is my focus of study. And that is my brief talk this, this very moment. So the project sponsored by PAR is aimed at looking at the resistance surveillance at the various nursing homes. So nursing homes, they are not hospitals, they are homes, elderly care that are built to uh, high, uh, inhabit uh, the aged. Um, because most of the Ghanaian settings, the aged are always left home and then their younger generation, they are, their children go to work, they leave them home. So for them not to be bored, they take them to these homes and then they, they stay there for a long period of time. So we just look at, want to look at the resistance that um, occurs among them as a result of the treatment that they have in these homes. Sorry, let me share my screen. Okay, I seem to have a problem. Uh, 
Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Uh, um, I want to change the screen, but it's not changing. Uh, just a minute, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why is this thing off? Yes, a moment. Uh, this is the sure. view of the challenges with uh, uh, being global. That the challenge is where being global. Now we we're connected from very various places around the globe. Uh, or, or do you mind me sharing my screen for you using your slide? Okay, okay, okay. okay. Because you have it, so you can. Good. Thank you, Gabriel. You can share from yeah, Gabriel. So you just say next and then I will move to the next. Yes, please. Yes, I'll do that. Sorry for the problem. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so I've, I've, I've said all this. So we can go to the next slide. Exactly. Okay. So as I said, we want to create a surveillance of um, resistance that goes on in the nursing homes. So our target was to, take, to start with five nursing homes in Ghana, in Accra specifically. Um, so we visited a total of five different nursing homes, all within the Greater Accra region of Ghana. We collect, we met a total sample size of one hundred and twenty patients who elderly patients within the age range of fifty to hundred years who reside in this home. So we took their urine samples. I should have mentioned earlier on we are taking the UTI those who have urinary infections, urinary tract infections. So we we took their urine samples. That was our target. So we came to the lab, we diagnosed of um, by microscopy to see what's, which ones have infections in their urine. And then we went around and then we isolated E. coli pathogens of those urines that are infected. And then uh, as, a, as a microbial resistance pattern, we determined the antibiogram. That is the how the resistance or how successful they are to the, the drugs that they give them there. And then lastly, uh, molecular biology methods, which is PCR, we detected the genes that are harboring in these samples. So that is their way of methodology um, as we did. Can we go next slide, please? Okay, so this is just to show you um, ex uh, exactly what we did uh, and uh, where we go. So you see the map down left there that has zoomed in uh, as I said, Greater Agrar Region of Ghana, and then we have, we visited five nursing homes, that is from A, B, C, D, A, E, as you see there. So you see that the A is a bit distant from the rest of them. So the A is a different setting, it's an urban setting. The one that you see at your right at the top, where the treatment is a bit different. They give them more drugs, they, uh, they treat them in a different way. And the other settings from the B to the E, you can see example or one place of them is down there, uh, the right down where you see that these don't get the best of treatment in terms of the care, in terms of the, 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 the attention given them. So these are two distinct areas of uh, 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 treatment. So we have the urban setting, the top there, and then the down there, we have the rural setting of home care as we visited them. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, we, we now took the samples, the, the data, their age, their, the work that they did um, when they were in the younger age, and even those who, who, who may still be working, the work that they do, and other parameters that we take. We came to number two, that is the urinalysis and the microscopy, to determine the, those that have infection in their urine. And then we go to the microbiology to look at the pathogens, especially the E. coli that's are happening in these samples. And then lastly, we look at the PCR where we have, we look at the genes that are happening, the ESBL, extended spectrum beta lactamases that are happening in these pathogens that we have extracted, that we have cultured and extracted. Next slide, please. Okay, so basically, um, this is what we, we we had in terms of the results, we out of the 120 samples, I, I said that we took 50 of them have the uh, United Tax infections. Uh, so we, we we focused on these 50. We were able to 
isolates the E. coli from 40 of them. That makes 80% of it. So um, as I explained, all the 40 E. coli have all at least one resistance gene with these resistance genes. This is the TEM, the CTX, the CMOI are being the most predominant. With regards to the drug resistance, so with, with regards to the drugs uh, and their susceptibility to a resistance, realize that majority of the samples, E. coli samples were resistant to cefixim, the uh, drug which is a cephalosporin, which is expected. And then just a, a few percentage, that is a 9.52% were resistant to the levofloxacin and the ciprofloxacin. So resistance were more in a nursing home located in urban settings, as the picture I showed you, to those who are in the rural setting. This is briefly the description of the results we've had so far. Please, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so this is um, what I was explaining with regards to the drug. The chart we see here is how resistant and susceptible the samples are to the drugs. So as I explained, you could see that when it comes to the, the one with the highest resistance, there's several examples, as uh, I explained, the 64.2 has the highest number of samples who are resistant to it. And then when you come to those ones that have less been resistant to the CPRO is one of them. And in between these two drugs, we have varying um, resistances that are being leveled again. So this will tell you how exposed uh, the patients are to antibiotics because these samples were taken from the, this E. coli were taken from the urine of the sample. So this shows us uh, what we call the, uh, the susceptibility of these E. coli to uh, the drugs that we tested against. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, as I explained, the two categories of, um, of, 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 of nursing homes that we did, actually just one of them was the urban setting where we realized for our questionnaire, they were exposed to drugs. They didn't do a lot of exercise and hence resistance tried more compared to the rural settings, but it was just one home which was urban. The other four were rural settings. And we realized that they did a lot of exercise. They didn't do a lot of antimicrobials in terms of their treatment. It was one of the ways we could link to the, we could link to explain the the, 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 the occurrence of uh, resistance at the urban settings to the rural. So you see that the rural settings, the percentage of MDR is multi-drug resistance. So the resistance is to, to more than two categories of drug. It was high in the urban setting and then it was low in the rural setting, the B, D, the B, C, D, and the E. So that is with regards to that. Next slide, please. So this is in general resistance genes. Um, as I've mentioned, on where we did PCR and then we exposed, we saw the number of uh, resistance in that way in the, in the sample. So from the 10 SHV up to CMY2, you could see we have distinguished between the male and the female. You, you would see that um, the female contains more resistances compared to the male. And also, this is not only equal, but this is other pathogens that were, that were uh, extracted from the urine. And then we exposed all to PCR to, uh, test to see the, 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 the resistance genes that they are, you could see that the, all the 10 that we tested against, each of the, each of them were present in the samples that were tested. So this tells us that um, nursing homes, which is not the focus of target of surplus of antibiotic resistance, uh, has a lot going on there. And we need to focus there because these are genes that some are common, some are not common but we have quite a number of them in nursing homes. Next slide, please. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, our study has proven so far for a year of study that prevalence of antimicrobial resistance is high in nursing homes in Ghana. As I keep saying, it is not been the target of focus of resistance, but there's a lot going on. So uh, we could see that the prevalence is higher in females and also in male. And as I've explained, the rural settings have higher than the, the, the the urban setting, sorry, has higher than the rural settings. Uh, for it being more in female than male, it could be because we targeted urinary tract infections, which because of the female anatomy has been designed, they have more infections compared to the male. And hence, we expect that we'll get more females who are UTI positive than males. 
So that is the conclusion of the whole idea. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so in doing this work, we want to acknowledge the uh, deep, uh, specific people, especially the PAR who have funded this. It's a three year work. We've done the first year. The other pathogens we've worked on, others we are yet to work on. And the work was done in Biomedical and Public Health Research Units of CSIR. And that is a symbol you see down there. These are people who helped in doing the work. We have Dr. Mauricia, Mr. Bright, Mr. Greg, Madam Frida. Today's a day, happy birthday to her. Isaac Kwame and then Mohammed, who is a national service personnel with us. So these are the individuals that have helped us to carry out this study. And there are more that we are able we, that we will do in the coming two years. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'll be around. Thank you. Most grateful. Thank you, Manuel. Um thanks for giving us the update on um, on the project. There are a few questions. Or do you mind uh, moderate those, uh, Gabriel? I can start. We have one okay. question. Yeah. yeah, are you there, Gabriel? All right, sounds good. Okay, so to the questions Perfect. from Federico, Federico Lovino, was only E. coli detected as pathogens in the urine samples? And then was the K1 E. coli invasive strain found in this in the samples? So I'll put it in the chat for you to get it better. So you, you see it in the chat. Okay. That's the first question about E. coli. Okay. Okay. So was was only E. coli detected in the as part of in the urine samples? No, no. Um, as I said, we are still um looking at it and we had Clefcell and other pathogens, but for this webinar, I centered on E. coli. So it wasn't only E. coli. It was because of this presentation. We are still working the other samples, uh, the other organisms detected, but I'm still working on their statistics. So it wasn't only E. coli, but what I presented was E. coli. Thank you. Then was K1E, e, coli invasive strain found in samples? Invasive strain, we have not tested the strains that we have yet. So we can't tell, but we have stored our strains so we can go back and then have a test with it. And then maybe in future webinars, I'll see whether they were, the E. coli were invasive or not. Okay, so there's a new question on the chat. So is OXA one and two encoding resistant to resistant to cephalosporin or carbapenems? So the OXA one and two we found they were resistant to cephalosporin because we see we see the way um, most of the resistance were to cephalosporin. So the OXA as one of the uh, resistance things that we saw in PCR. So we could say that the resistance is to cephalosporins from the work we have done so far. Okay, so there's a new question too. Can you explain why you focused on only on E. coli in your studies? For this, for the okay, the, one of the reasons is that E. coli is very predominant when it comes to urinary tract infections. So it was my first point of target. But as I said, it wasn't the only thing I've targeted so far. Other pathogens would follow. It's okay. level of self medication. I, the chat is going, I had. I read okay, so it. is level of okay. self medication in rural areas in Ghana lower than urban? Okay, so this 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 is medication, not self medication. So these people are they are in their home; they are not on their own. Yeah, so it is the home the the services that they are rendered to that gives them the medication. Self medication will be people who stay in their own homes and go to buy the but these people don't go to buy the drugs on their own. And there's a services that is rendered them. So they will say that the caretakers over there are those who really give them these drugs. But when you talk about uh, those who are in their own homes, which is not my focus of study, there's no, um, there you can talk about self-medication, but for what I studied, they don't medicate themselves. It is the nurses who take care of them that gives them these drugs. So there wasn't any self-medication in the study that I had because it is people who are in the nursing home who are being catered for Anything they do in terms of food, drugs, is being controlled by the, those who render the services. So it's not their self. So there's nothing like self-medication in my direction of focus of study. Then uh, what do you think is the cause of having more resistance pathogen from urban setting versus rural setting? Yeah, so so as I explained earlier on, the, the settings that they are, the urban settings have a lot of focus in terms of care. 
So I could say that those who 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 those who are taking care of them tend to medicate them compared to the rural. So the focus they in terms of the pay, in terms of the money they take is higher. So they make sure they give you the best. For them, one of the things that they do in terms of giving you the best is to uh, give drugs that they may not be able to tell whether it will lead to resistance or not. And that is the focus of the study, to see what is going on. Normally, these studies are done in hospitals where you have nurses and doctors who may be aware of uh, resistance. And they, they may be careful of the rate of uh, uh, drugs, they, uh, antimicrobials they give. But these are under different settings. People are doing business. They've set up their own homes. And so uh, they have their own settings there. So what I came to find out is that because the urban settings, they are well catered for, they, their people have paid more money, their attention and focus is there. They unconsciously give drugs. They think that they are treating them well, but uh, they, 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 they little they didn't know that this is causing resistance. So this is what I have really come out with. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the questions. That's, uh, it's, I love that you, um, are interested and engaged in the different sessions. But thank you, Emmanuel. That was really uh, insightful. You're most welcome. So those are the speaker sessions we have today. Um, next time we meet is October 4th, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, Central European time. Uh, there is a registration link um, on the screen right now if you want to register or we will make sure to share in our social medias uh, for you as well. Spread the word if you think this is something that your colleagues and friends would be um, interested in, in hearing. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, if you have ideas or questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me and Gabriel. And I will launch a survey um, once I stop this. There is a short poll of two, uh, three questions. Uh, if you have the time to give us some feedback, that will be very helpful. But thank you so much for today. Have a great rest of the day uh, and take care. Thank yeah, you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.